Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John chapter 2, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 11, and this is what it says. And on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited and his disciples to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots there for the Jewish custom of pur purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine, they did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then that which is poorer. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Pray with me. Jesus, breathe on us that this day we might taste and see your presence, your glory, and that we too, we too may believe, we may trust, we might lean on, have faith in you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The year was 1306. Robert the Bruce was king of Scotland, but he had been defeated again and again by the English armies. So he was, he was restricted to an island off the coast of, of Ireland, the island of Rathlane. And there in, in Rathlane, one day he began watching a spider as the spider was trying to attach its web to one of the beams in the, in the house where he was sitting. Six times the spider tried to attach his web to the beam and six times the spider failed to attach his web to the beam. And that's when Robert the Bruce turned to this little spider and says, Now shall this spider teach me what I am to do. For I also have failed six times. Well, you might guess how the story went. The spider tried a seventh time to attach its web to the beam, and that's when it succeeded. Well, Robert the Bruce saw it as a sign. He left the island, went back to Scotland, gathered together troops, and he won several campaigns until finally, finally in 1314 at the Battle of Bank. Bannockburn, Robert the Bruce won the independence for Scotland <laughs> because of the sign given by a spider. The sign of a Wouldn't we all like signs? Signs to lead us what to do, what not to do, and just follow the signs. 
That's what, yeah, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Well, that's the way John has organized his gospel to point to the signs. And, and John wants you and me to know that these aren't just signs in general. That these are signs of a new creation. So he starts his gospel with the same words that the, that the old creation story began with, in the beginning. And then here, here in, in verse 11, it says, The beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. Well, John doesn't just tell you, okay, well, here's one sign. In chapter 4, he says, and this is the second sign Jesus performed. In John chapter 4, verse 54. That we're supposed to be counting the signs. That it's key to understand that there's seven signs that John gives. Not seven days of creation, but seven signs of a new creation of a new beginning, of a fresh start, that Jesus has come to, to usher in this new creation. And this is the first sign. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Don't miss the signs. Don't miss the signs because it's here, it's here that Scripture gives us the signs that we're, we're supposed to keep our eyes out for, supposed to stay attentive to. So don't miss the signs. And the first sign that I want to talk about this morning is don't miss the sign of His presence. Verse 11 says, This beginning of His signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested His glory and His disciples believed in Him. Manifested His glory. I try and think about how many times in my life I've used that little phrase, manifested His glory. That would be just about zero. That's not the way I talk. It's not the way anybody I know talks manifested his glory. Some of your Bibles may have said revealed his glory. Well, still, that kind of leaves me dry. I, we don't talk that way nowadays about revealing his glory or manifesting his glory. But to the first century reader, these words would have screamed off the page. They would have screamed as almost being too wonderful to, to read and to read out loud because the first century reader knew that the, the glory of God, that it resided only in two places. One, it was in the heavens. And the second place, the only place on earth that the glory of God resided was in the temple and the holy of holies. And it wasn't the kind of thing that you'd load up the kids in the car and say, hey, we're going to go see the, the glory of God and, and it's in the temple and I'll just pull the curtain back and you say, there's the glory of God right there. No. It was far too wonderful, far too thrilling and far too dangerous for anybody just to gaze on the glory of God. It was only one place on earth there in the holy of holies and it was only the high priest that could enter into the glory of God, and only once a year. And it was so thrilling and so terrible at the same time that they tied a rope to his ankle. In case he died while he was in there with the glory of God, nobody was going to go in and get him. they just pull him out by, by his leg, by his ankle, if he died while he was in there. But John's telling us, John's telling us in ushering in this new creation, Jesus is ushering in a, a creation where His presence is known in a wedding. In Cana of Galilee. In a time and a place. Not just in the Holy of Holies, but in a wedding. In a marriage. In a home. That the presence of God is in the common, the ordinary. Wedding. Wedding home, the everyday in the ordinary place. Well, this is thrilling. This is wonderful. It is almost too incredible to hear. William Barclay writes, the home is such a paradox, a paradox where opposite things are true. On the one hand, it's the happiest, most precious place on earth. But on the other hand, we claim the right to be far more discourteous, more boorish, more selfish, and impolite than we would be to any society of stranger. 
We treat the ones we love most in a way we would never dare to treat an acquaintance. In the home, in the wedding, in the marriage, in the everyday, in the ordinary, that the presence of Almighty God is there. It's this new creation that, that Jesus ushered in over seven signs. And the eighth sign is the, the new creation fulfilled in the resurrection. The eighth sign is the resurrection of Jesus that happened in the garden on the first day of the week. Jesus is pointing to that resurrection, that resurrection where the resurrected Christ is in your home and mine. And I tell, tell you this, not as a source of, of fear, but as a source of hope, of encouragement that, that you're not alone, that the presence of the living God is right there with you. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. And what of the Spirit? 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has given us not a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. That in the everyday, in the ordinary, what Jesus did for you and for me, that He breathed power, love, and discipline. Not only that we would know we're not alone, but that our language might change, might build up and give hope, might encourage and give strength, that our language might recognize the presence of God. Yes, in our marriage, in our home, in the everyday, in the ordinary. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss the sign of His presence. And the second thing that I want to talk about this morning is don't miss the sign of His abundance. Mary turned to Jesus and said, they have no more wine. Well, we might hear that and go, well, that's too bad. Or, well, gee whiz, that, what a social faux pas that was. Well, this was more than just a too bad or a social faux pas, or, wow, I wish they hadn't blown it, oops. There are records of occasions where families were sued because they ran out of wine at a wedding. That we have on record occasions where fines were levied because they ran out of wine at a wedding. So Jesus didn't just blow this off as, well, it's their problem. But Jesus also didn't ask, how much wine do they need? What Jesus did do is he called the servants to fill up. Verse 6, it says, Now there were six stone water pots there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. He called for the servants to fill up six water pots to the brim containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Well, a quick math says that's 120 to 180 gallons of wine. Well, you, do you think that's going to be enough? <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a super abundance. It's gracious plenty. It's more than enough. It's more wine than they could ever possibly use. But this reveals the character of God that's, that's seen in the first creation. That in Genesis, when it says, and God created, that word created in Hebrew is barah. And barah doesn't mean he just kind of got together a few things. And, and it means to be made fat, to be made full, to be made abundant, to be made flourishing and overflowing. That the creation of our creative God has, has provided for you and me a, a creation that's, that's, that's full and fat and over, uh, overflowing and abundant, that's a gracious plenty. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And what are the riches of God? 
Well, I don't know, but they're overabundant. They're gracious plenty. They're fat and, and full and flourishing. That our God has, has surrounded us with more than enough. More than enough. And so often we think we have because we, we hold and we hoard. We think life too often comes from our, our wallets and our purses. God has more than enough for you and for me. And I've caught glimpses of it here in this church. Glimpses. The glimpses of a, of a gracious and abundant God that's letting you and me know we have an opportunity to change the world. And I'm not overstating anything. Because you've been generous, that when this pandemic started in, in March, because you've been generous, we were able to reach out to people in need. As soon as folks were sequestered in their, their homes and, and, and children were unable to go to schools and receive the school lunch, you and I put our little with God super abundance and we began feeding a thousand people a week right here in Roswell. Families that, that needed that school lunch. Families that very often couldn't work because of the pandemic that you and I jumped in immediately. Not because we hoarded and held, because we took part in, in God's gracious plenty. And then we continued to give. We got to take part in what God was doing in the world in a gracious, gracious way. That you and I, that we got to take, to take part in what God was doing. Because you were generous, that we were able to hire Hilma Kantu and reach out to families here in the community that online, online we could tutor children, tutor children, members of our church tutoring children online in reading because English was their second language. It's a generous God did we get to take part in what He's doing? Not when we hold and not when we hoard. But when we take part in, the, in this, this new creation that Jesus ushered in. We get to take part. And because you have, as soon as, as this pandemic started in, in March of last year, you and I were able to give to help single moms and their families with housing. We wanted to make sure that they knew that that as a church, that we were there. So, on faith, we reached out and we, we gave everything we had pledged ahead of time so they would know that they were safe, that our God is an abundant God, and because you were generous, we were able to do that. We were able to reach out with food and medicine to one of the poorest places in this hemisphere, Venezuela, with food and medicine, and to reach out folks, to folks who need to know that they matter to God, so they matter to us. But not only this hemisphere, because you've been generous, we were able to reach out to young women in Egypt, to reach out medically to folks in, in Jordan, to let them know that they matter to God so they matter to us. Our God, our God has poured out onto you and me a gracious plenty. And I want to invite you to take part in His grace. Take part in His fullness. Take part in His flourishing. Take part in His, his generous heart. And to give because when we give and, and take part in what God's doing here in the world, it changes us as well, and it changes the world around us. Don't miss the sign of God's abundance. Give, 
and give generously. The signs, the signs, don't miss the signs. Don't miss the signs of of His presence. Don't miss the signs of His abundance. And the last thing that I want to talk about is don't miss the sign of God's victory. When I was a kid, I used to really enjoy watching sports programming on TV. It was a long time before there was ESPN. And um, probably the folks who did it best in sports programming was ABC Sports. Jim McKay. I don't know if you remember the bumper that started all of their sports programming. It was the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And just in case you don't remember that little bumper, the the video that started every sports programming, I have it for you to view on screen. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. The thrill of victory, absolutely the best, and the agony of defeat. Oh, look at him go! <laughs> you get the idea about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Over 20 years, that little bumper led all of ABC sports programming, and the thrill of victory changed. Over those 20 years, sometimes it would be racing, car racing, sometimes it would be track, sometimes it would be hockey, sometimes it would, but the agony of defeat, it was always the same. Vinko, (laughs) Vinko Bogataj, he was Slovenian ski jumper, and he was always the symbol for the agony of defeat. Wouldn't that be awful, being the symbol for the agony of defeat? You walk into a party, and they don't know you by name, but they know you're the agony of defeat. Well, I don't know that, it, that anybody would understand that any more than Christians sometimes do. That so often, Christians like to practice and rehearse their last defeat. So often it is, Christians like to go over and over again, maybe not the last defeat, but the worst defeat, as if there's something religious in going over again and again and again the agony of defeat. Jesus ushered in a new creation by the cross. He wiped away the agony of defeat for you and for me. All those things that would destroy us. The label of defeat that that sometimes Christians want to live by. It's a lie. Because what Jesus did on the cross, He wiped away the agony of defeat. And on the third day, Jesus rose from the grave that you and I might know the thrill of victory. And it's, it's here, at the beginning of John's gospel. John has to... To, to let that, that, the thrill of that victory be known at the beginning of his, his gospel, 19 chapters before the resurrection happens, and in John 2, verse 1, John writes, And on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. On the third day. You and I know what happened on the third day. You and I know exactly what happened on the third day. Jesus, our Lord, conquered sin, conquered death, and all those things that that might destroy us in defeat. And He rose again in victory that you and I might know the power of His victory, the power of His new creation alive in you and me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. That we don't drag around the agony of defeat anymore. This morning it may be that you've been living in an old creation, not knowing that 
The Spirit of the risen Christ is available to you now, today. And that you've missed the signs of that new creation. Knowing that that the power of the risen Christ begins to make you brand new every day. By each choice, by each decision, His Spirit makes us into someone that we weren't before. That we live in Christ through the power of His Spirit. It may be that you've missed the signs of His gracious plenty, of His abundance, and that you've Instead, you've been living under the sign of, a, of gaining and grabbing and holding and hoarding. And it's held you captive. Jesus has more for you than that. He has power enough to, to open up your hand and your heart to take part in what He's doing in the world. Or it may be that this morning that you didn't know that His presence was there in your home, in your marriage, in the everyday, in the ordinary. And that this pandemic has has caused a difficult time, a hard time. And you don't know that you have power enough. It's okay to say No, I don't have power enough in the everyday, in the ordinary. It's okay because Jesus has power that you and I don't have. Not the spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. And I want to pray for you right now, this day, that you might know His presence. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, we need Your power. We need your love, and we need your discipline flowing through our lives. Not just at church, not just some place where we are not, but right where we are this day. A power, a power that will, that will break the spirit of this world. Power that your spirit will live through us that we might see the signs of your presence, see the signs of your abundance, and see the signs of your victory in our lives. Breathe on us your spirit that we might know that strength, not one day, but this day. And that we may walk in your new creation, not one day, but this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.